All right, guys. Welcome to your last unit. This one is organic chemistry, or OCHEM, if you like. And um, we're going to stick to uh, the basics of nomenclature here. I think you guys will like this unit. It is uh, straight up nomenclature. We're going to learn about the carbon-based molecules and a very, very specific set of rules on how to name them. Uh, you're going to have flashbacks to when uh, your chem Science 10 teacher was teaching you some of those rules about how to name uh, ionic compounds and things like that. But um, we have a lot more variety in uh, OCHEM versus inorganic molecules. Uh, I had it described to me when I was uh, sitting where you guys are that if all of the chemistry we were looking at in chemistry 10, 20, and 30 with ionic compounds and the simple molecules we looked at, represented about 4% of all the molecules in the universe, then the organic chemistry molecules would represent the other 96. So you can imagine that the set of rules that we have for this is going to have to be very specific. So let's get into it. Um, there's some Chem 20 connections that uh, you might want to go back and look at, such as intermolecular forces, bonding capacity, and so on. All right. Um, you guys can research that one on your own. Uh, to try and make sure that we can get through this and finish the course by June 17th, uh, your chemistry teachers and I have decided to eliminate uh, the stuff on oil and gas and all of the connections to our oil and gas industry. We're going to keep the one really important concept of fractionation in there, but we're going to eliminate all the, the mining and refinement stuff. So 9.1 is gone. We're going to get into the alkanes. This is our first and uh, first type of organic molecule that we're going to uh, look at. Don't worry about it uh, too much uh, at the beginning here. There's lots of stuff, again, on where we find these reserves and how we make our uh, fossil fuels and where we get them from. Don't worry about it. Okay, coal formation, bitumen, as much fun as it is to talk about. All right, we're going to save that for future courses if you... Uh, follow that in your career path. So, we get to about the fifth page of the notes and we are ready to begin our little discussion here on organic chemistry. Okay, so organic chemistry, you know, really just relates to organic carbon. We're taking a look at what was first looked at as organic compounds or compounds that derived from living or once living things. These were molecules that were thought to be only uh, possible through some sort of vitality or life force. It wasn't until about 1828 that the first organic molecule of urea was synthesized in a lab, and we started to lo look at carbon a little bit differently and how we might differentiate between inorganic carbon compounds and organic carbon compounds. It's just the nature in which they bond uh, it's the nature in which they behave ionically versus molecularly, and so on and so forth. So there is a differentiation that we do have to start with. And so we take a look at carbon, which we have largely ignored up until this point in high school chemistry. The biggest uh, distinction that we have between organic and inorganic compounds is this carbon-based compound that we see, and then you know, the stuff that we've been looking at so far. Most carbon-based molecules are organic in nature, but we do see a few exceptions to this, and you might notice that most of them are ionic versions or compounds involving carbon. These are considered inorganic. And if you remember from biology, your carbon oxides are also considered to be inorganic. So what makes an organic molecule then? We look at situations in which we have carbon bonded almost exclusively to itself or hydrogens. All right, so we are going to start our journey in looking at what are known as hydrocarbons or small to long-chained carbon structures that would only have carbon and hydrogen within them. This will make our first mm, sort of foray into uh, organic molecules. Now we can add on to this, we will take a look in chapter 10 at what are known as hydrocarbon derivatives. They will have carbon, hydrogen, and at least one other thing in them. All right, but for now, we need to take a look at the simple hydrocarbons to begin with. So, here's what makes carbon so gosh darn unique. 
Carbon has one of the highest bonding capacities of anything that is on the periodic table. Carbon does have four valence electrons in its most normal atomic state, and therefore carbon, if it wants to fill its valence, must form four bonds. This is actually a hard and fast rule for carbon. It must always facilitate a full octet and therefore have four bonds. What this does allow carbon to do is it allows it to form bond with other carbons nearby and any additional atoms like the hydrogen. So there are a lot of things that we can pack into a single carbon. If we're going to talk about hydrocarbons and our fossil fuel resources, there are some issues. There's not an awful lot of other things to bond with when we make a fossil fuel or hydrocarbon reserve. And so carbon will also form single, double, and triple bonds to meet its needs. What this does do is it allows carbons to form sometimes very long chains and often very stable chains. It also allows for some really interesting variety. Carbon can form straight chains. It can also form branched chains, which means there can be small offshoots from, uh, let's say, a main chain. It can form loops and rings. And we will look at all three of these particular structures. There are other, uh, other ones that we can also continue to look at, but we'll save those for future courses. We can take a look at sheets, tubes, um, full uh, three-dimensional spheres. And what's really quite unique here is that carbon is about the only atom on the periodic table that we know uh, so far that can do this with this much variety. So we're going to have an awful lot of organic compounds. For organic compounds, we are going to focus on the hydrocarbons. This is chapter 9. There will also be the derivatives, which we will look at in chapter 10. So there's your dividing line for your remaining two quizzes. What we're going to go through in chapter 9 is we're going to take a look at the two types of hydrocarbons. There are the aliphatics, which we've already heard one name, the alkanes, the alkenes, and later the alkynes. We can also look at the cyclic structures that go along with these guys. And then there's this one special ring structure that we want to take a look at known as benzene, which comprises a second group known as the aromatics. So this is what we're going to get into here with chapter 9.2. When we take a close look at our first group, the alkanes, this is easily the most simple organic class of compound that we have. They're simplified in the fact that they only possess single bonds between your carbon atoms. What this does is it minimizes the amount of carbon to carbon bonds and maximizes the amount of hydrogens that would have to come in and fill carbon's bonding capacity. So we identify an alkane as possessing the maximum number of hydrogens per carbon atom. This is now known as a saturated hydrocarbon. Okay, the carbon has a maximum amount of attached hydrogens, therefore we describe the molecule as saturated. There is no other room to attach any other atoms anywhere in the carbon chain structure. This means that they're going to follow a general formula, and you can certainly use this. All right, for every carbon, there will be two hydrogens plus two more. All right, so for example, if I had just one carbon, then I would have two hydrogens, there they are, plus two more, and we see that same ratio for something like methane. We have to figure out how to model these guys. One of the biggest issues we have with organic uh, chemistry is the sheer variety of different compounds that we can get. If we just take a look at these uh, alkanes, the CN, H2N, plus 2 arrangement. We can take a look at a few other examples of this. And we've been using molecular formulas for all of our inorganic molecules, and it's been a sufficient way of looking at it. They give us enough information to be able to develop a picture of the crystal, or to come up with a name, or to derive a formula. If we take a look at what happens in organic chemistry, we run into some issues. Here's ethane. For two carbons, all right, it would take two times that, or four hydrogens plus two more, 
to balance it out. So we get C2H6. Propane, C3H8. And then look what happens when we get to C5H12. Okay, C5H12, our molecular formula, actually has three different structures and names. This means that your empirical molecular formulas that we've been using for ionic nomenclature and so on and so forth, well, they do tell us things to calculate molecular weights and give us the proportion of carbons to hydrogens. What they do not do is give us enough information to be able to draw the structure or name the structure. So we are going to have to look at different modeling techniques in order to be able to describe the uh, individual molecules. In other words, we have a situation that is unique to organic chemistry called isomers, and we are going to have many different structures that will have the same chemical formula. All right, we'll get into these modeling techniques in uh, the next part of the video.